morning, church. We've been gone a few weeks and it's so good to be back. Walking in here today was just incredible this morning. Um, I'm reading the Bible this morning and our Bible reading is taken from um, the book of John, chapter 15. Thanks for increasing the volume. I always appreciate when you do that. <laughs> um, and we're reading from the New Living Translation. It says, I have loved you even as my Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. And this is my best part. Yes, your joy will overflow. Amen. 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 Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you're my friends since I have told you everything that the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love one another. May the Lord bless his word. Amen. Good morning, church. You can see, please be seated. My name is Dio, and that was my beautiful wife, uh, Funto. For some reason, they always do it this way, by the way. She always reads the day that I'm going to say something. So uh, I think it's just a shine that she gives me, you know, just to prop me up. Uh, I'm Dio. I'm one of the uh, many volunteers here at uh, King City Church. Um, and I'm also one of the co-leads of the Richmond Home Group. So do we have any Richmond Home Group folks in the house? <laughs> we paid some people to... <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. I'll get you a check later on, okay? All right, problem. Um, as you know, we've been going through this series called Gospel and the Movies. I'm going to move back a little bit. Um, and the purpose of the series is to just highlight some of the truths uh, that we see in church, but, you know, sometimes the world doesn't recognize it. And it's to show that many people, not just Christians, actually recognize this truth as well. They may not know where it's from, but they see it. And by the way, you know, this series, we did it last year, so this is the second installment of it. It's very, very similar. Well, I mean, I say it's similar, but it's not that different from the way that Christ himself taught, right? Christ would take things from his culture and things around him, and he would turn them into parables to kind of illustrate spiritual truths, right? And so this month, we've been looking at clips from different movies to highlight some of the gospel's climactic narratives. And the point of this exercise, of course, is to show that these concepts that we're talking about, concepts like forgiveness, love, sacrifice, they're universal concepts. And that we can all recognize it even in popular culture, even though sometimes the world doesn't know that the source of those ideas is in the Bible, right? Now, as a Marvel fan, nothing gave me more pleasure <laughs> than watching and re-watching and re-watching the movie we're about to look at today. I'm sorry, Funto. I know Funto was like, you're watching that movie again? I was like, Funti, you know. It's for the Bible, you know? Where I, I pray every time I watch it. I pray before I watch it. I pray after I watch it. I mean, I don't know what you want me to do, you know? Um, but the idea, like all the movies that we've watched in the past, is to show a parallel, right, between these core concepts of our Christian faith. And today we'll be talking about sacrifice because the scenes that we're going to watch today, they do dwell on that. So I'll pray, and then we'll watch the scenes, and then I'll come back. 
Father, Lord, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for every person, every family that's represented here. We ask, O oh Lord, that you open our hearts, open our minds, so that we can learn something new and live our lives according to your will. All of this we ask for in Jesus' name. Amen. Amazing movie. Now, if you're familiar with the Marvel Universe, especially the portions we just watched this morning, you'll recall the storyline leading up to those, those scenes, especially the last scene, the very emotional scene. Tony Stark, who's played by the actor Robert Dow Downey Jr., is Iron Man, an individual who's just brilliant, sheer genius, He's able to come up with this technology, you know, embedded suit of armor that allows him to fly at supersonic speeds, incredible strength. And all this time, his fragile body is cocooned in this metallic suit of armor. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice for us to have that? And together with all the other Avengers, superheroes who themselves have superhuman strength like Spider-Man, Hulk, Thor, Captain America, and so on. Tony Stark protects the Earth from dangerous beings who seek to destroy or subjugate all life for one reason or the other. And the most impressive of these dangerous characters out there is Thanos. Now, in previous installations of the Avengers Infinity Stones, um, Thanos comes on scene, and I don't know if you guys have seen that. It, it's impressive when Thanos comes on scene. And Thanos is driven by this one singular goal, to create balance, in his words, in the universe. According to Thanos, you know, the universe is teeming with, with life, not just human life, but just life across the, the spectrum. And all of this life tends to overuse resources. So according to him, in order to put the universe in balance, you need to destroy half of the lives so that the other half can thrive. When the actor who played Thanos, Josh Brolin, was asked, why didn't, why didn't Thanos just use the stones to create more resources if that was the problem, right? I mean, it would make sense. What he said in response was very surprising. He said, he said Thanos was very callous. He viewed all life as a tool to help ensure the universe's survival. That's another reference to another Marvel uh, movie, The Eternal Celestials, anyone? He simply didn't care about people or the lives that they lived. Anyone could suffer for his goals. In other words, Thanos, to, to Thanos, all living creatures were a means to an end. He didn't care about them. He was willing to wipe them out at the snap of his fingers to create his version of balance. You can see here that Thanos represents, again, a parallel to you know, popular culture, to what we see in uh, Christian faith. An indescribable evil, which itself parallels the character that Apostle John describes as the thief in John 10.10. 10. Remember, the thief comes to steal and destroy. And just like the thief, Kronos, Thanos has created his own justification for his actions, right? He justified it. And at the end of the Infinity Wars, which is the movie before this one, Thanos actually just does that. He gets all the Infinity Stones, snaps his fingers, and destroys half of all life that ever existed. And after that, he retreats into a remote planet and is basking in, in the in the, in the glory of what he had just accomplished. And note, although Thanos destroyed half of the lives, he didn't destroy himself. He wanted, it was all about everybody else, right? He, he needed to be there because he had created this perception of, of himself. Now, while Thanos is enjoying the glory of what he just did, the, the Avengers, they're, they're gathering together and trying to figure out, okay, we need to reverse this. We need to reverse the effect of Thanos' action. And their plan required them to reinsert themselves into time, 
to reverse those consequences. Does that sound familiar? And in the lead up to the scene we watched this morning, the Avengers had successfully reacquired all the stones from different points in time. And they had reassembled them to bring everybody back. And Thanos gets wind of this. And so he comes with all of his army. And this time, he's not just coming to destroy half of all lives. You heard him. He was there to destroy all lives. Now, in the battle you saw in Sue in the scene this morning, literally dozens of heroes and thousands of people showed up to protect good and vanquish evil. And at the end of the day, Iron Man makes the ultimate sacrifice that costs him his life to preserve the lives of those around him. Truly heartbreaking stuff. I remember when I watched that, um, the, the, the hashtag I love you 3000 started trending because that was the last thing he said to his daughter. And you know, there was all these videos on social media and grown men were just crying, I mean, uncontrollably just sobbing. And you know, you may think to ourselves, it's over a movie character, but it touched them. And this story, like many other stories where, you know, a bad guy is intent on destroying and a good guy comes in and, you know, saves the world or, you know, wins the fight and sometimes it costs him something or someone important. This story plays out in many different ways over our history as human beings. So this is not new. But why do you think that scene that you know, we just showed with Iron Man died. Why do you think it evokes so much emotion from us? I think it's because deep in our DNA, we we're meant to resonate with that simple act of sacrifice, right? This, the, the act of sacrifice where someone lays down their life in exchange for our life to continue. Or as Professor John McAtara said in his in his essay titled, The Gospel According to the Marvel Universe. <laughs> that superheroes, superhero stories in particular help us see our own role in bringing about the better world. Having experienced Marvel's universe where ordinary people gain powers that bring them responsibility to do good, we may be awoken to the fact that in the real world, each of us has our own kind of power and therefore our own responsibility. Most of us are not wealthy or politically influ influential, but everyone has power over something, even if it's only his or our own choices. And our calling in Christ is to use whatever power that we have to bring God's love to the suffering. Isn't that true? In Hebrews 11, the Bible lists quite a few heroes of our faith, people that we all know who had their flaws, but Nevertheless, they sacrificed a lot to advance God's kingdom, and in so doing, they saved, they saved a lot of lives. It mentions people like Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, people who wrestled evil in their own time and ultimately chose good. In particular, regarding Moses, Hebrews 11, 23 to 27 says the following. It says, it was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's commands. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. A few weeks ago, we were having a discussion about this uh, particular passage in Hebrews. And I think for the first time I noticed it, that it said that and according to uh, the NIV version, Moses did, re regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Now, if you're like me, you're like, wait a minute. Moses, Christ? I thought they were like 1,500 years apart. Like, did they overlap? Did Moses know Jesus? The short answer is this. God did reveal 
Christ to Moses. And you can find evidence of that in, in, in De Deuteronomy 18, 15, when Moses prophesied Christ's coming. And he said, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from your, from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. But more importantly, Moses believed that this coming Christ, he believed that this coming Christ had a lot to offer him, more than all the treasures in this world. And he was willing to put everything that he had on the line for this Christ. In case you guys don't know exactly how much Christ, how much Moses sacrificed, um, Bible ex expositor Homer Kent wrote this. He said, the wealth and opulence of the 18th century dynasty is well known from the tombs and temples that remains of the, of the Egyptian rulers. The fabulous treasures discovered in the tomb of Tatankuman, a later pharaoh in that dynasty, spoke eloquently of the luxuries available to royalty in Egypt. Moses gave up great wealth for the greater wealth that he had in Christ. And some historians have said that regarding Moses, that when he was growing up in the Pharaoh's palace, there was a kind of like a power struggle, right? The Pharaoh's son was sickly, and nobody really knew who was going to take over. But Moses, being the son of Pharaoh's daughter, was in the running. He had just as much of a claim to being a Pharaoh as everybody else that, that was there. But he gave this up. So you see, Moses and the rest of the folks are exactly the kind of heroes that we should look up to. And who do you think they point to with their actions? The ultimate superhero in whom they themselves would later place their trust. Christ Jesus, the Son of God. While Moses would sacrifice all sorts of benefits and riches in his quest to serve God and to liberate his people from the clutches of Pharaoh's grasp, Christ would suffer the ultimate sacrifice, a gruesome death in his quest to liberate the entire world from the clutches of sin. Iron Man's character laid down his life for his friends, and in so doing, the curse of death was reversed, and their world was restored, and our hearts were warmed. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Perhaps it's because it points to a, an ultimate superhero in Jesus, that because of what he has done, by laying down his life, down for us, not only are we reconciled back to God, but the Bible lets us know that one day, the dead will rise again, and our broken world will be renewed and restored. Amen. 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 So what does this mean for us today in the real world, not, not in the Marvel Universe movies? What it means is that we're all called to be heroes in our time to those that are around us, but not for our own purposes, but for the purpose of pointing everyone to the real superhero, Jesus Christ. It's what knowing that you don't have to have a metallic suit of armor or be the god of thunder like Thor, or have rockets and guns, although I think that would be nice too, but you know, that's just me. You don't, you don't even have to have your, your entire life figured out. You can still be a hero by being Jesus' hands and feet today to everyone that you come into contact with. Sometimes Hollywood tends to exaggerate things, right? They make it seem impossible to attain. But to me, I think a more realistic picture of a hero is a man named Nicholas Winton. In 1938, shortly before Christmas, Winton was planning a vacation to Switzerland with his family. And following a call from some of his friends in Prague, he went there to go kind of see the situation. Prague was about to fall under the occupation of the Nazis. This was before World War II. And they were dire need to, to try to help the Jewish refugee children in that country. And so Winton leveraged his connections and the British government to secure a passage for all these kids, 669 of them, to get away from Prague. There was one last train that he was hoping to get out of Prague, but that train didn't make it. And so that you all know the consequences you know, that some of these things have. All 250 of those children 
They eventually died in German concentration camps. In 1988, 50 years after the fact, Winton was invited to BBC for a television program called That's Life. I want you guys to pay attention to this. I think it will be very helpful to understand this. Amazing. To be honest, I, I, I was kind of conflicted about showing that. I went back and forth on it. I spoke to Dio, I spoke to Funto. I was like, ah. And the reason was because Winston, who was born a Jew, would eventually come to abhor organized religion. And he would eventually, you know, describe organized religion as organized hypocrisy. Because according to him, you know, we need, we need something more. We need something else, something else that exhibits goodness, kindness, love, honesty. Now, if I'm being honest with myself, I think Winston is kind of right that religion can't save us. As a matter of fact, you can probably argue that the more religious we get, and I'm one of them, by the way, the more I'm likely to forget how to live Christ's commandments in practical ways. We don't need a religion. All we need is a person. And who do you think encompasses all those qualities that Winton talked about? Goodness, kindness, honesty, love. I think we all know the answer to that question. It's no one but Jesus Christ alone. He is good. He is kind. He is honest. And he is loving in a sacrificial way, not just, you know, internet love. <laughs> we all saw the aftermath of Iron Man's sacrifice on his body, the wounds, the scars that the gamma rays left behind, right? But if you've read the account of Jesus' death, you would know that Jesus' suffering on our behalf was even more compelling. As he was raised on that cross after getting whipped countless times, his full weight would have been on the nails on his hands and feet. And because he would have been on that cross for so long, his arms would have been stretched and probably dislocated at some point. And in order for him to breathe, he would have had to like step on the, on the nails on his feet just so that his, the, the, the weight on his diaphragm would be relieved so he can breathe in and breathe out. Which makes it all the more amazing that while he was up there, while he was suffering up there, he, he spoke a few times. And one of those times, he said this. This was important to him. Father, please forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Upon all this suffering that Jesus bore for the weight of your sin and mine, suffering the wrath of God so that we can all be forgiven. He went through all of this, all of this pain, suffering, Betrayal loss, just for you and I. As I said earlier on, Hollywood tends to exaggerate things and make them impossible to attain. And when we think of a story like Jesus' story, yes, it's, it's kind of hard for us to match that. In fact, no one can do what Jesus did. Only Jesus can do what he did. But you can start with the little things. You can sac sacrifice the little things. Like, Rahab, when, he, when she um, covered for the spies at the risk of her personal safety. Or Ruth, who sacrificed her comfort in order to follow her mother-in-law to a, a land that she did not know. Or even the widow that gave up her last might. Or to bring it more to a modern day context, and this is my personal hero. Do you have a picture of Mrs. Savage? This is Mrs. Savage. Now, I'm not sure you guys all know this. Uh, the people that are close to me know. But in college, I actually became homeless. I had been living with my aunt, and I came back from college one day and you know, saw a foreclosure sign on, in, on the front of the house. My aunt was out of the country at the time. I couldn't reach any of my cousins. And they had the, a little sign that said, to the Seton family, the rest of your stuff is in the garage. Please lock it up when you get your stuff. 
I had never been homeless before. <laughs> so I, I didn't know what to do. And so I couch surfed with a couple of people. At one point in time, I slept in my car for a few hours, I, just totally out of sorts. And then at some point, I called one, one of my friends, the only friend I could think of. His name is Midday, and that's Midday right there. And Midday said, come through, son. And so I went over to his house. And as soon as I got there, the first thing I did, I just, I just slept. Because you don't realize how much you need sleep when you don't have a bed. So I just slept for a few hours. And when I woke up, I told him, I said, hey, Midday, hey, I think we need to have a conversation with your mom. Because it's not like I have somewhere else to go. So you need to let her know that I, I think this may be a long-term <laughs> arrangement. He hesitated initially, but he went upstairs and he went and talked to his mom. And then he came back downstairs and he said, my mom wants to talk to you. By the way, I should note that I wasn't the only one in the house. She had like five children in the house already. And she was a single mom, widowed, and she had a full-time job. If she had said, I don't need any more children, I would have understood. Because this is a kid that she didn't know. She didn't know who the family was. She didn't know what kind of issues he would have. If she had said, I'll give you two days to sort yourself out, but you need to go, it would have been perfectly understandable. But as I approached the side of the house where she was, I honestly wasn't expecting what she was going to tell me. What she did next blew my mind. She said, Mide, her son, here's the key to the house. Go to Walmart, make a copy for Daya. That was the first time anyone had made a copy of their keys for me here in the US. And I was just 19 at the time. I still have those keys to today, by the way. I told her the other day, make sure don't, don't change the locks, because I can still come back. To blow my mind even more, she explained that the reason why she was doing what she did was because when she was a kid, her house caught fire, and she and her siblings became homeless and someone took them in. And so she was paying it forward. So you see, you can sacrifice where you are and what you have. You don't have to have it all figured out. And without the savage's sacrifice, I wouldn't be standing here today. Like literally, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. I always remember their sacrifice every waking moment of my life, much in the same way that those people that you saw in the Winton video will probably remember Winton sacrifice every moment of their waking lives as well. Put simply, the Lord has blessed all of us differently, but his commandment to us is all the same. In John 13, 34 through 35, he says, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must Love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So as we leave here today, I'd like to leave you with a, a thought. What does God put in your hands that you can use to be for the service of his kingdom? Is it your home? Is it your time, your experience? People often think it's money, but I can tell you it's not always money. I pray we will all spend time today in prayer, just asking God, reveal to me who it is that you want me to be your hands and feet to this week, even today, as soon as we leave here. And remember, guys, that love is a nice, warm feeling, but there is no love without sacrifice. There isn't. By loving others in a sacrificial way, we point to the one who loved and sacrificed his life for us. And in so doing, we can look to even an even greater future, or even greater reward with him, greater than any treasure that this world has to offer. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you for your ultimate sacrifice in sending your son to die on our behalf. We ask that you continually remind us of the sacrifice and what it cost you and that it spurs in our lives this constant source of just gratitude for your love, for your grace. 
help us figure out what it is that we can do to make other people feel better, to feel your love even more in our lives. All of this we ask for in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, if you're blessed by this, go ahead and celebrate God. Come on, we can do a better job than that. Let's celebrate God for uh, what he's done for us. The gospel's narrative is that not only had Jesus paid for our sins and washed us clean and that because of his sacrifice for us, we get to be reconciled to him. The gospel's narrative, which is different from every other narrative and every other faith movement in the world is that this, that because of what he's done, he's gonna renew our broken world. That all those who have been lost, we will see them again. So I don't know if there's anybody here who's lost a loved one, who's lost a mother or father or grandmother, a brother or sister. The gospel's narrative is that, that you will see them again because of what Jesus has done. The gospel is not just what we need for here. It gives us incredible hope for tomorrow and for that we are grateful. So let's celebrate Jesus one more time. The ultimate superhero, the ultimate best friend who lays his life down for us so that we can be reconciled. And Father, once again, we're so grateful. We're grateful for what you've done. May we remember it and may it transform us to be your hands and feet here in this world. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. And amen. And amen. Let's celebrate God one more. Yes. And can we celebrate my brother Dio, Pastor Dio? Incredible, man. Incredible. Incredible. Dio and Funto uh, happened to lead um, the Richmond Home Group, as he mentioned earlier, a thriving, thriving group. Um, word has it uh, that Funto makes the best meals. And so even if you don't have a home group, and even if you're just hungry, Richmond's the place for you. <laughs> yeah, you got the Richmond people testing to that. So thank you, Dyer, for all that you do. And matter of fact, we have somebody here who's going to be giving the announcement.